Welcome to worship on this Sunday, September 6th. We begin a new theme this September, learning to love our enemies. Today, talking about conflict and reconciliation. Conflict is a part of relationships and life in community. Paul reminds us that love is the fulfilling of the law. We gather in the name of Christ, assured that Christ is present among us with gifts of peace and reconciliation. Welcome. Let us pray. O Lord God, enliven and preserve your church with your perpetual mercy. Without your help, we mortals will fail. Remove far from us everything that is harmful and lead us toward all that gives life and salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Romans. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandments are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now, the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Good morning, children. Well, in our house, we've been a little sad all week about the last full week of summer. And now here we are at Labor Day weekend, one more vacation day to go. But we just heard Paul writing to the Romans, now is the time to wake from sleep. And that makes me think about this coming week when many of us, if we haven't already started, will be starting school. So this is a blessing for each of you beginning school again. And for all of you who are not beginning school, I invite you to raise your hands in blessing for those who are. 
As we begin this new school year, we give thanks that God has given us the ability to learn many things in many ways. We learn in school and we also learn in church, in our family, in our neighborhood and community. Learning is a gift from God. The Bible tells us that Jesus learned and studied just as we do. And Jesus grew in wisdom. We ask God's blessing on this new school year that it might be a time when we appreciate and fully use God's gift of learning. We ask God to bless our schools and teachers. We ask God to bless our classmates and friends. We ask God to bless our principals, counselors, and librarians. We ask God to bless those who support our learning at home and everyone working hard to keep us safe. We give thanks to God for all the devices that help us learn. We give thanks to God for the gift of learning. This week, there will be gift bags coming for you, coloring pages and colored pencils, snacks for godly play feasts, and a sticker that says, peace be upon you. This week, you can think about where you are going to be studying most and where you could put that sticker as a reminder of God's peace with you every day. Let's pray. Loving God, sometimes a new school year seems exciting or scary or both. Sometimes school is great and sometimes it is hard but we know that whether we are excited or scared, you are with us. We know that when school is great and when it is hard, you are with us. Thank you for always being with us. Help us to remember to show our thanks for your gift of learning. Help us to do our best each day. Amen. today comes from Matthew, the 18th chapter. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. I was about six. My best friend and I were down in the basement watching a video. We got to the end and I got up and turned it off. She asked me to turn it back on to watch the credits. I refused. She began to cry. I dug my heels in, and then her cries turned into sobs. My mom came down, surveyed the whole situation, and understood. She sent me to my room and held my friend in her arms. I felt mad and offended. It was only the credits after all. 
but I also felt embarrassed and guilty. I don't know if this is one of my defining life moments, but I can tell you that at least ever since then, I have hated being confronted by something I did that wasn't right. In fact, I try to avoid conf conflict on a regular basis, trying to either keep one step ahead of it or to interpret and reinterpret it so that I can squeeze the conflict out. How do you deal with conflict? Some have no problem with it. In fact, they might even enjoy it a little bit, kind of like a competition. Some are determined to be right and can't let it go until they win. Some are barely affected by it. But perhaps the more important question is, what's going on inside of you during conflict? Especially when you're on the receiving end of being told you did something wrong or hurt someone else? Like six-year-old me, do you feel embarrassed and guilty? How about angry or frustrated? Sad? Vulnerable? Ashamed? It is a hard thing to be on either side of conflict. It is hard to be on the side that speaks up and says that something was wrong. It's hard to be on the size, side that caused that wrong and is now hearing about it. I'll bet many of us when we find out that we were in the wrong, didn't actually intend to be in the first place. I mean, all I did was skip the credits, right? A few years ago, I was working in the kitchen getting ready for a meal. Volunteers had been slowly arriving, and I was in what I call kitchen mode, when I am moving at a quick clip and often with tunnel vision to get everything done before the meal begins. Well, we did get everything done, and when it was over, and I was busily cleaning up and most folks were gone, a volunteer came up to me and quietly told me that she had felt ignored by me when she came in to help. I can tell you right then that my tunnel vision broke open and my high gear abruptly shifted into reverse. It was jarring. At first I felt defensive, like I was busy and I was trying to get things done. I didn't see you. And then I felt horrible. Even though I didn't mean to make her feel that way, clearly my actions had done so. And she had been brave enough to say something. I took a breath. Thank you for telling me. I said, I'm so sorry that I made you feel that way. The brief conversation that ensued was a little hard, but it was honest and it was true and it was important. It is a hard thing to be on either side of conflict. It takes courage and humility in our reading today, Jesus shows us that those things take listening. Not passive listening that just lets words in one ear and out the other, but active listening that seeks understanding and amends. Active, compassionate listening on both ends that wants forgiveness to mend the friendship, the partnership, the marriage. Before this teaching on how to deal with conflict, there is the parable of the lost sheep. <laughs> After, there is the teaching on forgiving not just seven times, but 77 times. Then the parable, the parable of the unforgiving servant who kept mercy from another person, even when he himself had received mercy for the same offense. These are stories of relationships within the community, the flock. In his commentary on this reading, Michael Chan writes, 
It is no accident that Jesus' instructions about confrontation follow, follow immediately upon the parable of the wandering sheep. In that parable, the Father in heaven is compared to a man who leaves his 99, 99 sheep to track down a single wandering sheep in order to restore it to the flock. Similarly, Christians are called to confront one another. But as part of an explicit attempt to call one another back into the flock. With this idea to draw each other back into the flock, we see that confronting one another in order to repair relationships with honesty, listening, and forgiveness is central to Jesus' teaching about living in the world as Christians. From community defined intimately to a broader scale. You've probably noticed that our current culture contains a lot of confrontation, especially in social media and in the news. This is often called call-out culture, in which often systemic problems are written or spo spoken about publicly. While it is essential for us to confront the evils of injustice like racism, sexism, classism, and more, the way it is done can often backfire, widening rifts and breaking any chance of understanding between two parties. It even builds up walls of defensiveness and pride. Spoken word artist Joe Davis prefers to reframe this kind of culture by calling people in instead of out. This is the turning point for understanding, understanding the importance of Jesus' words around confrontation. If we are going to people who can lovingly call out the hurts and wrongs of injustice, then we would do better to treat them as we would, would a conflict with a beloved member of our own community. Treat them as our friends, our family members, our spouses, our fellow Christians. This is hard work, dear people. It requires courage, humility, vulnerability, and compassion. These are the tools that help to bring down the walls we build up between ourselves. If we are to dismantle the walls of systemic injustice and oppression, then we must also work to bring down the walls of defensiveness and pride. So, when we need to confront someone, go to them with courage in one hand to hold your own truth that you or another were hurt, and compassion in the other, remembering what it is like to be told you did something wrong, and with intention and, for intention and forgiveness to mend the rift. Call out to them as you would the lost sheep, bringing them back into the fold. Call out to them to abundantly disperse forgiveness. Do this for others knowing that Jesus has done this time and again for us. Call each other out to call each other in.
And now in response to the word, we say our own words of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble. Cast away our transgressions and turn us again to life in you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims, your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ, led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Unite your church, O God. Grant us the gifts of repentance and reconciliation. Bless the cooperative work of churches in this community and in Masamiki, Aringa, Tanzania. Strengthen ecumenical partnerships. Guide the work of the Lutheran World Federation and the World Council of Churches. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Protect your creation, O oh God. Teach us ways that do not harm what you have entrusted to our care. Renew and enliven places suffering from drought, flood, storms, or pollution. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Turn nations and leaders from ways that lead to death. Shape new paths toward peace and cooperation teaching us to recognize one another as neighbors. Guide legislators, civil servants, judges, and police toward laws that protect the well-being of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Tend to all in need of your compassion. Hear the cries of those awaiting justice and those yearning for forgiveness. Give community to the lonely and neighbors to the outcast. Shelter all who are vulnerable in body, mind, or spirit, especially those we think of now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain us in our work, O oh God, and give work to those who need it. Shape societies to ensure fair treatment for all who labor. Help us to love our neighbors in and through our work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember with thanksgiving those who have died in faith. As you equip them, equip us with your protection and power. Until with them, we see your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All of these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jumripsua Salam. The peace of Christ be with you all.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with this rich food and drink, and send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world. Through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. blessing. Mothering God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen.
Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God.